Well, happy Resurrection Day. He has risen. He has risen. Glory to God. <clears throat> this song that you're hearing, it is written after Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37 describes a valley of dry bones. And in fact, verse 2 said, they were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Have you ever seen a completely dried out bone? <clears throat> this passage that you're reading here describes the people of Israel. They were at a spiritually dry place. Now, have you ever felt like you're just dried out? Maybe your faith is dried out. Maybe you feel like your relationship with God is dried out, your joy is dried out, a situation, a relationship is just dried out. And you almost convince yourself that there's no way that thing or that person could ever be resurrected again. You know what I'm talking about? You feel what I'm talking about? I want you to know God led you here tonight because he wants you to know he's able to breathe life into any dried out situation you are in right now. You have a big God who loves you and he cares about you and he hears your prayers. Turn to the person next to you, just tell them he hears your prayers. He hears your prayers, that's your God. And I want you to know Jesus is able to breathe life into any situation, any situation. He loves you and he cares about you and he wants you to know him. When you keep reading this, you run across another verse and it says this, verse five, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, everybody say, look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. God's really good at this. When he breathes life, it comes to life. When there was no life, he brings life. And here he says, I'm gonna put breath into you and you're going to live again. And here's the DNA of the resurrection right here. I love it, verse six. Here's the DNA of the resurrection. He says, I will put flesh and muscles on you. You know what he's talking about? He's going to give you strength that you don't have. He's going to give you strength that you don't have. He's going to lift you up even though you're worn out, even though you're exhausted, even though you feel like it's too late. He's going to give you a new joy, a new peace, a new strength. That's what he's going to do. And he's going to cover you with skin. See, your God is so good when he resurrects. He also knows how to protect. And you may fall again, but it's not going to be like the last time. You'll get up and you'll continue to walk by faith because your God is with you and he'll watch over you. I will put breath into you and you will come to what church to life. Anybody need life today? You're not here by accident. The Lord brought you here. You might think it's because of a baptism or Easter or whatever it is, but I want you to know Jesus wants to bring life to you. And he's doing all this so that you will know that he is the Lord. Happy Resurrection Day. Today, I, I, uh, when I was, uh, uh, well, incidentally, thank you, worship team, and thank you for all of you who put this together. We had uh, volunteers and staff that were here till two o'clock in the morning last night, or two this morning, and they uh, helped put together this whole design. They, this is, uh, we're gonna have like nine consecutive days of church, because we had church every day during Holy Week, and it's been, it's been wonderful to be a part of it. But uh, uh, I'm just so grateful, my heart is full, and I just know the Lord has a special message here, guys, so I'm so glad you're here. So this morning I woke up and, and, uh, and I just felt like I need to hear a word from the Lord. And I don't know about you, where do you go when you need to hear a word from God? Where do you go? Do you seek out? Um, sometimes I'll turn on uh, radio or something like that, and I'll listen to music, and I'll listen to lyrics, or I might look at a podcast or a video or whatever it is. And the Lord spoke to me today and, and uh, gave me an incredible word that, 
that I am precious in his sight and he gives me strength and he is my joy. And I just wanted to share that with you because I think maybe you need to hear that. Maybe you need to be reminded that God is a big God. I think when we come to church, when we worship, it puts everything in perspective. That's why it's so good to come to church every weekend. Your problems get smaller and you recognize your God is bigger. And you worship him and you recognize that he is Lord and he is king and you have nothing to worry about because your life is in his hands. Your life is in his hands. Make sure you guys make it easy. Yeah, help the preacher. Help me preach here, guys. Uh, help, me, help, help me out a little bit. God is so good. <laughs> um, this, this story that we read, it all comes out. I want to read the famous story here. This is uh, Matthew chapter 28. It says this, early on Sunday morning, as the, days, as the day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and, her, and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. Isn't that good? His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid with me. He said, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Oh, my word. Here's the mic drop verse right here, guys. Verse 6. Here it comes. Let's read it out loud together. He isn't here. He is risen from the just as he said he would come, was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, thank you seems like it's such an understatement. Uh, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the people that are in this room, Lord, worshiping you. We need you so desperately. And you know, Lord, Easter is always one of those sermons and days where there's so much running through my mind, Lord. So I just want to ask you to anoint this message. I know it's from you already. So I pray that your Holy Spirit works in me and through me. You know what every soul needs to hear right now, God. May every soul hear a word from you. I pray for those who are watching online right now. I pray that you meet them in a very special way also. Thank you for being such a good God. I do pray for our country, our world. I pray for health. Um, I pray for healing. Uh, I pray, God, that, that you just work through everything um, for your glory. Bring comfort and joy and peace and protection to those that need it, Lord. And may you, Jesus, be glorified. We're in your hands. It's in your name, our risen one, that we pray. Amen. I want to welcome those who are online. Thank you so much for being a part of this service. I'm excited about this day. Um, the title of this message today, or this series, this whole thing that we're talking about is Breathe. Can you say breathe with me out loud? Breathe. That's what it is. That's the, that's the billboard. That's what we're looking at. And, and, and uh, I like the way uh, Phil Wickham said in the song Living Hope. He said, then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Now, breath has become especially meaningful for me. Um, back in, I guess it would have been uh, October or so, I, I had COVID and I was 10 days in ICU. And I remember looking at my little breath thing. I, 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 uh, I, I learned like the pulse, pulse oximeter. I, I never knew what that was. And I, I just got, had a whole new vocabulary that was thrown at me. But I remember how precious breath was. And I remember saying this prayer, saying, Lord, if you give me breath, I'm going to use it in a greater way for you. 
I think we could maybe take for granted the breath that we have. And sometimes we're reminded how fragile we really are. You know, scripture says our life is the width of a, our hand. It's really short. It's like when you have kids, you know, you know, I was always told when I had kids, they grow up quick, life is short. And now I would do anything for my 21 year old to be five years old again. Um, sometimes I feel that way. And <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Parents, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh my word. This is, and incidentally, you never stop parenting them. You never stop parenting them. And now they, they have all kinds of things and, you know, that they, 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 you know, have technology has changed. We grew up drinking out of a water hose and they don't know anything about that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm so tempted to give them like an eight track tape and just watch, you know what I mean? <laughs> or a phone that dials and say, okay, go for it. See what you got. Uh, how do you dial? How do you, how do you, how do you make a phone call? Um, but I, as I think about this and I think about Jesus, what I kept, kept thinking about was Jesus when he was in that tomb and he was, he was dead for, for three three Jewish days, three Jewish days, and he was dead. And at some point, you know, I wish I could just like lie down right here and show you, but at some point he was like, he started to breathe. He started to breathe. I know how special that is after being on my chest for 10 days. And he started to breathe. And I, I think about Ezekiel and the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones and how breath entered and all of a sudden he came to life. And Jesus, it's like his blood oxygen level went up. His lungs started working. He started to inhale and exhale in this dark, dark tomb. Death couldn't hold him down. The grave couldn't hold him down. Hell itself couldn't hold him down. Nothing could have held him down. See, Jesus had a mission. He had a mission. And it was to seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. See, the power of the resurrection is where dried out bones begin to breathe. Dried out bones begin to breathe. You know, Paul, he said, I want to know the power of the resurrection. Paul the apostle, I want to know the power of the resurrection. And I think there's a difference because, you know, it is a difference with like going to church and knowing Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? It's like I could, I could binge on Netflix or something and watch something related to, you know, hunting in the Serengeti or something. I don't know. You can't really hunt there, but hunting or wherever it is, or you know, go out to some jungle or something like that. But if I've never been there, I don't know it really. You know what I'm talking about? See, so you could know something and not really know something. You can go to church and think you know God or not go to church and think you know God, but then there's knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection is the most unstoppable force on the planet. It's right there where the work of the Holy Spirit. God wants to breathe this new life into you. He wants to give you new strength, a new hope. In the Old Testament, you see breath come up over and over. In fact, Genesis chapter two, it's one of the first things that's mentioned. Verse seven says, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. God breathed into dust, and that dust became a living person. Living person. And then when you look at the oldest book in the Bible, which is the book of Job, some people say dinosaurs are mentioned in the book of Job, and, and you can read it, but in the book of Job, Job said this, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. I mean, that's a real awareness. Did you wake up today thinking, oh, thank you, God, for the breath in my lungs? I mean, are you aware that the breath that you have right now is a gift from God? He goes on to say in, in chapter 12, he says, for the, for the life of every living thing is in his hand and the breath of every human being. And God is so gracious. God will give breath to the person that is not seeking him. God will give breath to the person that doesn't want to have anything to do with God. See, if you have breath, the grace of God is over you. Because God is giving you this breath because you have a purpose and, and, and the Lord wants you to know him. That we all have something in common. All of us, this breath that we have comes from the hand of the Lord. 
In the book of Daniel, Daniel tells a, a, an evil king named Belshazzar this. He says, you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Wow. There's this idea of we're accountable for the breath that God gives us. I mean, the words that come out of our mouth, what we think, what we say, what we do. There's a spiritual reason for the resurrection. I want to make sure we all understand. I mean, this is an incredible event that just rebooted our entire calendar system. And because of Jesus, we're no longer taking any Passover lambs and we're no longer sacrificing. We don't know the Old Testament Mosaic law. We're not involved with any of that stuff because Jesus went to the cross for us. But here's why. Proverbs chapter 14 says it like this. There is a way which seems right to a man or woman, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right. So we all have a box of beliefs. We all have a box of beliefs about God. Maybe he exists, maybe he doesn't. What's right, what's wrong, how we treat others. We have this custom theology that we walk around with and we make decisions. And here Proverbs is telling us that there is a way we can think we're right, but it could actually be wrong. You know, turn to the person next to you and just tell them you might be wrong. Can you do that? <clears throat> I know it felt really good. <laughs> Some of you guys are shaking your head. That's just pride. That's a whole other, whole other issue. Lee Strobel, who was a former atheist. If you haven't seen the movie Case for Christ, it's a little bit old, but it's a great movie. He said this, Satan greets people in hell by saying, you'll find that there's no right or wrong here, just what works for you. Mm. Just what works for you. You think about it, a lot of our decisions are, bent, are based on our own reasoning, our own rationale. When I mean, you think about the expense that God did, I mean, God sent his only son into the world to go to a cross for us. I mean, the cross is the ultimate example that there's a right and there's a wrong. Because why would God have had to send his son if we could have made the way right within our own strength, within our own way? Why would he have gone to that kind of expense if there was not a right and there's not a wrong? The God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. The devil wants you to believe there's no real truth. The devil wants you to believe church is a waste of time. The devil wants you to believe that this whole book, it's not real. It's outdated. You don't need it. The devil just wants to separate you from the God who loves you. And I just want you to know that's the agenda of the devil. Scripture tells us he's the father of lies. He's the father of lies. So those, he's just a liar. You just need to know that. Because you belong to God. Your soul belongs to God. And God wants you in heaven. God loves you. Verse uh, chapter 3 of Romans says it like this. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of the God's glorious standard. It's a good verse to memorize. That means none of us have it all together. Starting, starting up here, guys, with me on stage. We've all sinned. We all need the grace of God. We all need redemption. Doesn't matter whether you recycle. Doesn't matter what size your footprint is. Doesn't, well, doesn't matter. You help your neighbor with a trash can, whatever. We've all sinned. We all need the grace of God. We all, we all have. You never have to teach a kid to lie, right? It's just something that just kind of happens. Kind of happens. We're born with sin. And we sin because we're sinners. All of us. But here's the good news. I love the way Romans 4.25 says it. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. There it is. That's like the whole New Testament in a nutshell. He was handed over to die because of our sins. He became a sacrifice, a perfect, unblemished sacrifice for our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Uh, NASB version, New American says it like this, for our justification, meaning just as if we've never sinned. So you think about it, Easter changes everything. I mean, if, it, if he died on the cross and it ended there, he would have been just another guy. He would have been just, in fact, Scripture says he appeared to hundreds of people, maybe even thousands. 
People saw him walking around and talking. So when you look at the apostles' teaching and you look at the Acts, the book of Acts, and, and, and you see the churches, everything was written based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything is about the resurrection of Jesus. Everything about it. I want you to hear this. Death is a prerequisite to life. See, Jesus had to die for our sins. But you can take that principle and apply it to everything. When you have to, I, I, gotta, I gotta replace one of my bushes at my house because of that snow that fell and broke a bush, and I gotta put something there. But you know, when you plant something in the ground, good farmer knows this, with right enough rain, with the right amount of rain, that thing comes to life, right? I mean, when you put something in the ground and you bury it, eventually you see life come through that and you see a shoot and you see it kind of grows. That's, it's the same thing in our relationship with God. If you want to know the life God has for you, you have to be willing to die to yourself and live for him. You've got to be willing to die to yourself and live for him. You've got to be willing to die. You've got to be willing to nail that attitude to the cross. You've got to be willing to nail that insecurity to the cross, that lust problem to the cross, that anger, that pride, that selfishness, whatever it is, you've got to be willing to nail it to the cross. That's when you experience the resurrection power of Jesus. See, you can call yourself a Christian or a good person and not know the resurrection power of Jesus because it's a supernatural power that has the ability to change and transform even your own character. And so many times we want just enough of Jesus that we can get to heaven, but not enough for us to be transformed. Not enough for us to know his will today. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 11. He raised this guy to, dead, uh, to life that had been dead for four days, and, and he told his sister this. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they, they die. Everything Jesus touched came to life. Jesus is life, and he brings life. I mean, there was a story of, of, of a widow's son when he's on his way to to, to meet someone, and while he's on his way, there just happens to be a funeral procession that is crossing in front of him, and he, he recognizes there's this widow, and she just lost her only son, and all he does is he goes and he touches the coffin and told the boy to get up, and he got up out of the coffin. Another story involving Jairus' daughter, uh, this is a, a time when, when this, this man came and he had a 12-year-old daughter that was dying and, and, and he, he says, okay, you guys, you guys are all mourning. She's not dead. She's only asleep. And everybody laughed. Everybody laughed at him. So he sent them all out with the exception of his, you know, P uh, Peter, James, and John. And they go in and then he tells this young man, my child, get up. And he gets up. And then, of course, Lazarus. He says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus just comes out jumping out, you know. And everybody's like, oh, the stench, four days. But there he is. Just because something is dried out doesn't mean it's too late for God to resurrect. Just because something's dried out doesn't mean it's too late for God to resurrect. If Jesus can call a stubborn fisherman to follow him and leave everything, he can call you out as well to follow him and leave everything. If Jesus can provide a feast showing just five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 plus people, he can provide for your home. You don't have to worry. If Jesus can give a woman who was married to five men and the guy she was with wasn't her husband, if he can give her hope, he can give you hope. Hope, and she became a phenomenal missionary in Samaria. If Jesus can calm a storm, he can calm your storm. It's not about the storm, it's about who's in the boat with you. If Jesus, it's not about a, an absence of trouble and problems, it's about who's in the boat with you. If Jesus can remove the shame of a woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus can remove your shame too. You don't have to live with that kind of shame. 
If Jesus can miraculously awaken the muscles of a guy who's been paralyzed for 38 years, he can do the same with you and give you new life. If Jesus can make a repulsive leper clean, he can make you clean. That's what Jesus does. He's, he, everything he touches comes to life. If he can command a legion of demons to leave a man and go into a herd of pigs, he can deliver you from any demon that's oppressing you. That's your Jesus. And if Jesus conquered the grave and death, you have nothing to fear in this world right now. You have nothing to fear. Glory to God. Yeah, let's put our hands. Praise Jesus. He's everything. He's the living one. This isn't pop psychology. This isn't just making us feel good stuff. We're crying out to Jesus, the risen one. Turn to someone and just tell them Jesus can. If you're watching online, type Jesus can in the chat room. God always amazes me. God has the ability to bring life. Pastor Nick, who is up here singing, he's our youth pastor, and his wife is Rachel. And uh, they were in the hospital. Actually, Rachel was the one who was in the hospital. And uh, while she was in there, uh, it, what happened was she had a brain tumor, and they just discovered this. But I, wanna, I want you to know how God moved, and she's doing well right now, praise the Lord. But I, I want you to know what happened, because I didn't share this last week with anyone. But um, <clears throat> it was back in February, my wife, Grace, encouraged Pastor Nick and Rachel to read the book of Daniel. And this was, they didn't, they didn't know anything about the tumor at that time. So they started reading the book of Daniel and many verses popped out to them. But little did they know that Rachel would be diagnosed with a brain tumor just two weeks later. Sometimes God prepares us and you don't even know that he's preparing you. He's preparing you right now for something and you don't know what's on the horizon, but he knows and maybe that's why you're here right now. So two weeks later, she's diagnosed with a brain tumor. And, uh, and then in late February, a, a couple here at church, uh, Austin and Carrie, uh, they, they met with the McCalls and Austin quoted a verse to them out of the book of Daniel. So it keeps going back to Daniel. And here it is, verse 17 of chapter three says, if we were thrown, this is the time when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three guys, three Hebrew guys, were being thrown into a fiery furnace and they wouldn't worship, uh, they wouldn't worship the, 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 uh, the king there and they wouldn't, wouldn't eat their diet or any of that stuff. So, so they were thrown into this blazing furnace and then they said this, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, everybody say but. But even if, say even if with me, even, okay, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That's resolute faith. It's resolute faith. But even if, but even if, I know my God can move any mountain, but even if he doesn't move this mountain, I'm going to put my trust in him. I know my God can heal me, but even if he doesn't heal me, I'm not going to forsake my faith. I know God will do it. I know he's, nothing's impossible for him, but if he doesn't move the way I think he should move, even if, he's my God. He's my God. So this really spoke to them, verse 18. And on the day of the procedure, they were driving down I-25 to Sky Ridge Hospital. And the Lord put, reminded Rachel of Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. And she posted something on her Facebook group page about Daniel chapter 3, 18. I didn't know anything about this. And I'm driving down I-25 because I'm going to go spend some time with them in the hospital there and getting ready for surgery. And I'm with Pastor Nick, and, and he's sitting over here, and I'm sitting over here. And Rachel is, is back in the room, and she's getting prepped for surgery. And the Lord uh, tells me, <coughs> Reuben, um, read your devotion today. Now, I'm on a plan. This is just my personal plan. Um, but I'm going through the Bible chronologically, you know, literally beginning with Genesis and working my way through. I just read one chapter a day and there's all kinds of good plans. It's just something that I've done for a long time. So I've been doing that for years and years and years. So I'm reading one chapter a day, at least in the morning. Typically, I find that my morning, my days 
are better when I start off with spending time with Jesus. <laughs> and I spend time with God. My days are just so much better. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and I had to meet them, I think, like at 6 a.m. or something like that at the hospital. So it was pretty early. So Rachel is back there, and, and Pastor Nick is over here, and, and I'm right here. And I thought, <clears throat> the Lord just tells me, Reuben, read, read the devotion. And I'm like, well, I'm sitting here with, with, with Nick. I should probably spend a little time talking to him. And the Lord says, read your devotion, Reuben. And I said, all right. <clears throat> so I get, open up my Bible, and, and there it is. I turn it to Daniel, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> I happen to look there in my devotion. Did you know, incidentally, the Bible has 31,102 verses? 31,102 verses. So I'm reading it, I'm in Daniel chapter three, and I get to that one verse right there, that, but even if, and, I'm, and the Lord says, I want you to read that to Nick right now. And I leaned over and I said, hey, Nick, I got something to share with you. And I said, I'm in the book of Daniel. And uh, <clears throat> God just wants me to share with this with you. And then before I even say anything, he looks at me and he goes, but even if. And I'm like, oh! God, look how he moves. Did you see that? I go through the Bible one chapter a day. Sometimes I miss a day. Sometimes I miss a day for whatever reason. In fact, that previous week, I missed one of the chapters. And it just so happened that I've been in this thing for over a year going through this thing, chapter by chapter by chapter. And it just so happens the day of his surgery, I'm in Daniel chapter 3. It's like God knows everything. God knows everything. You don't have to be afraid. He sees your life. He knows what's going to happen to you next week, next month, next year. He knows you by name. You belong to Jesus. And he loves you. You need to go back to your creator, the manufacturer. Right? When your phone breaks, what do you do? <clears throat> You call the case company or do you call the, your cell phone people and say, oh, my phone broke? You go back to the manufacturer. Your manufacturer is God. He made you. He created you. He put breath inside of you. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is life. He is life life. All you need is Jesus. Say it with me. All you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. All you need. When you run across someone who's just a pain in the butt, you can just tell them all you need is Jesus. <laughs> You'll make friends. <laughs> Husbands, don't tell your wives that now. When it's, <laughs> just duck if you tell them that. Just duck. Wayne Cordero said this, God must first accomplish something in you before he can accomplish something through you. It's good stuff right there. See, God wants to do something inside of you. Many times we say, God, I want you to, and God's calling you right now. Jesus is calling you right now. I feel it. Jesus is on the main line. <laughs> Tell him what you want. <laughs> oh. But he wants to do something inside of you. Will you let him? Don't let this be just a one-time event. Uh, I, I'm gonna say something that might be pretty profound, but there's a pretty good chance every one of us in this room will not live forever. I'm going out on a limb. We don't know. I felt like I was about 10 steps away from death. And the Lord said, Reuben, I need to take you deeper because I wanna use you in a deeper way. And I was good with that. I'm good with whatever. But the Lord wants you to know his resurrection power inside of you. You do not have to live with shame or guilt or regret or remorse. You don't have to live in spiritual darkness. You don't have to live with that kind of weight. Your God loves you and he wants you to experience his presence here and now in the world you're in right now. He wants you to recognize his goodness. You know, the goodness of the Lord is all around us. The goodness of the Lord was last night when I was hanging out with my, my team over here and we're here at one o'clock in the morning and we're cracking up jokes. 
and laughing. That's a moment right there. The goodness of the Lord is when I'm just having coffee with someone or if I'm walking with my wife or we're walking with my dog that needs Jesus, whatever it is. And there's the goodness of the Lord that follows us all the days of our life. Do you recognize the goodness of the Lord? The breath that you have in your lungs comes from God. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to give you an opportunity, guys. We're not done with church, so do not leave. Let me just say that. You were going to see some phenomenal baptisms, guys. Jesus is still in the business of changing lives. Glory to God. He's still in the business of changing lives. <clears throat> this is a church you can come to. If you don't have a church, come to this church. If you don't like this church because I'm not in a suit, then go find a church that preaches Jesus that you feel comfortable at. But go to church because Jesus loves you. So we have these phenomenal baptisms that are going to be happening. But here's what, before we do this, I want to give you an opportunity to turn to Jesus. Some of you, this might be a first time decision. And you're going to say, I want to, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I don't know all the, you know, answers and I'm not sure all the questions I should ask, but I want to start a relationship with Jesus. And I want to lead you in a prayer. Others of you, maybe you consider yourself a good person, or maybe you used to go to church, or maybe you even consider yourself a Christian, but you just haven't like been tight with God. I want to say a prayer for you, a recommitment prayer, and I want you to come back home. I want to encourage you to come to church next week, but let me pray with you. Let's, let's bow our heads. Jesus, we cry out to you. Thank you so much for the empty grave. Thank you for the cross and the empty grave. And Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit as well that you, you, you bring on us. Thank you. And if you're ready to receive Jesus, would you say this prayer? Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord, my Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Right now, I choose to become a Christian, and I turn to you with all my heart. I, do, I make this decision right now. I choose to become a Christian. Others of you, maybe you need to say this. God, I need to recommit my life to you. I want to seek you out. I recognize you're the giver of my breath and I want to know you more fully. Jesus, show yourself to me. I want to come home. Thank you, God, for your grace and your love. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.